Money. Money. The game everyone plays, but few win. Extracting the knowledge from the top 1%. Extracting the knowledge. And teaching you the ever-changing rules of play. It's time to level up and take control of the money game. Let's talk money. Big, big, big money. Yes! Welcome back to the Money Game. We've got a, a very special guest on today, Brad Baldridge. How are you doing, Brad? I'm doing well. Well, we're stoked to have you. I, ever since the your team reached out, we had the opportunity to start talking. I was looking through a lot of your material. And for everyone listening, Brad is a, a financial specialist, specifically in the niche of dealing with taming the high cost of college is, is the name of your company and kind of your specialty helping parents, families, students prepare to overcome just what seems like a crazy mountain these days. And it's just climbing, climbing, climbing. Yes, absolutely. Well, obviously, first off, we're going to jump in to a ton of stuff. I, I, as I went through a bunch of your material and some of the different things that are going on, I think just everyone in the world, I'm pretty close to the college age. I have kids. I have a lot of buddies, friends, people who've gone through college, ended up with crazy amounts of debt know people whose kids are getting ready to go through. So I think this is something, as I realized how niche down you could get on this and how much content you had available and resource, I was like, dude, we, we got to have this episode because there is this is a huge issue in, in the country right now. Um, but as you, you've you been doing this for 20 years, so you're, you're pretty ahead of the curve. How did you get into this or foresee this being an issue and something that you could serve? Um, yeah, so about... 20 years ago, I, I've been a financial advisor for about 30 years, but about 20 years ago, I started getting more involved in the college process. Mm -hmm. And as, as I would help people with it, I get a lot more questions. And eventually that led me to get, getting some training and so forth. And then about 2013, I launched a podcast and then I really kind of jumped in with both feet. Yeah. Um, but it's always been expensive and it's always been a challenge. Education has been part of financial planning for the last 30 years. Okay. Um, it just has gone from a small little piece of the pie to a much bigger piece of the pie for most families. Yeah, I, I was looking, I just quit Googled and I, I've, I feel like I've found a million different numbers or statistics kind of quoting what the inflation rate of it all is. But I got one from bank rate. I'm, I'm sure you probably see this stuff all the time, but it's a, you know, over the last 40 years on average, like a bachelor's degree has gone up 153% from 1981. It was like 11,840 all in to go to four years of school to now the average student is about 30,000 bucks. Is that right? Pretty correlated yeah, to what you're seeing right. or, or what you're doing. Okay. And then just as you started this 20 years ago, what are some of the, just the challenges? Cause I feel like in my generation, especially in younger something that is a super unique Obviously, you've been doing this in your financial planning forever, but a lot of parents, grandparents, my generation, I feel like we got advice that was under the assumptions that college was the same price and that the careers that college would give you gave the same margin of return against what college was when they went to school. And it's obviously changed right. a lot. How has it evolved for you in the way that, you know, you just mentioned, right? It was a little piece. Now it's, it's kind of a massive piece. Right. Exactly. So... I think one of the watershed moments was 2007, eight financial crisis, the downturn mm -hmm. up until that time, college was kind of the Holy grail where all you had to do was figure out how to get through college. And that would launch a fantastic career. And that career would pay you so well. It didn't really matter how you paid for college or what happened. It was just, you know, borrow if you had to, if mom and dad could pay, that was great. But if you, you know, again, you borrowed everything you could, you'd still be fine. Go at all costs. Well, the kids that were, right. But the kids that were graduating in 2007, 2008, were having a tough time finding careers. They had, you know, drunk the Kool-Aid, so to speak, and they did borrow a lot, a lot of money. And all of a sudden, those rules kind of changed where maybe you weren't able to earn enough to just automatically pay back whatever you borrow. Mm -hmm. And not every degree is gets paid the same, et cetera, et cetera. And that's when the movement of, well, college isn't worth it kind of launched where, you know, and again, the, the right answer, of course, in my opinion, is college is worth it for some and not for others. And that's the challenge See, is that's... you can't assume it's a good thing. You can't assume it's a bad thing. you got to understand it, how it applies in your situation. 
I, I love that you brought that up. And I, that was something I want to dive into deep because it, my high school experience, I graduated in, in 2014 and our high school, it was, I think it was still under a lot of those assumptions and kind of that Kool-Aid drink where it was just no matter what, go to school, get into the biggest school you can, the best school you can. And we didn't really talk about the degrees or what jobs would come of that. It was just, we were told, Hey, over your lifetime, like to guarantee you make more money, all these different things. And I have a ton of buddies who now have graduated with multiple six fit, you know, six figures of debt with a degree that they're not working in and it was pointless and it, it didn't open up opportunities for them and they're still doing good. But I think to, to your point, you said it's good for some people. It's not good for like, it's very particular to a student. What are some of these things that you're identifying as you're working with families and with people that are preparing for the college decision that are like the missing links that people are not thinking about? Right. I think it's the, first of all, college is not right for everyone. Yeah. Right. There's a certain subset of kids that are going to do fantastic no matter what they do. You know, Bill Gates didn't go to college. He was successful. Right. They, you know, again, they get these Anomalous. very select poster children for whatever mm -hmm. you want to draw. Out. I mean, so if you're as brilliant like Bill Gates, you probably don't have to go to college. You know, and, and again, but if you're that brilliant, you'll be fine no matter what you do. You could go to college and you'd still do fine. Yeah. I think there, you know, so there's the top academic kids that are going to do well academically and academics is their thing and they certainly should be going on to college but then there's the middle group and the bottom group and i don't you know again just exact numbers i don't know where you would fall but there are certain people that just shouldn't go to college and how do i know that well half the people that start college never finish is that the and number? all they do That's, is run up that and now? don't have a degree What's that? Is that the actual, it's 50% of people who enroll don't finish now? Yes. Wow. Okay. So if you're going to go for a year or two, take on some debt, waste a little time and then go on. And again, some people learn enough in college to know it's not right and they still do fine. But I think, again, the whole assumption that everybody should go to college or parents that think their kids have to go to college mm -hmm. or whatever it is, is don't necessarily push college where it doesn't belong because I think that's the recipe for disaster because um, there's a lot of and I'm not saying you don't need an education everybody needs an education yeah college is one way to get an education I think that that's, there's on the job training yeah there's the school of hard knocks there's lots of other ways that you can get an education I, I think and, that's such an interesting distinction that I, I don't feel a lot of high school kids are getting right now um at least it wasn't when I was in high school and maybe it's evolving. And I think it is to a degree because there is a lot of kids graduating with these crazy amounts of debt that are like astronomical in you know, liberal arts or social. Not that that's bad, but you can't spend 200,000, a hundred thousand dollars to get a liberal arts degree or band, you know, musical theory degree. In my opinion, I don't know. I, I don't know if maybe there's people who make that work somehow and they get the ROI, but I think I personally went to school made a ton of connections and it was awesome. I was in a really good position where I didn't have to take out any loans and ended up finding a sales career and entrepreneurism. And I, I do feel that school played a huge role in being a catalyst for me to unfold and like develop what I needed to do, the connections and the people mm -hmm. and the infrastructure, even though I didn't go finish school, but I was in a position where the ROI, I, I didn't, I wouldn't say I didn't need to, but I chose not to and it worked out financially. I think- right. For you, though, you said, you know, there's a lot of like the school of hard knocks. I think sales is entrepreneurism. In my opinion, as I'm seven years down that road, I feel that there was very few things in my undergrad that were leading me to be prepared better than just running business and, and going and doing the game. Right. What what spaces or what degrees do you think would be? outside of entrepreneurs, I'm like, what are the ones that are, you're like, Hey, these are the spaces for sure. Kids, if you're interested in this and this is where you're going, like these are, these are where college gives you a huge dividend. Right. Yeah. And in one of my podcasts, I interviewed a kind of a career expert and he had an interesting way of looking at it, which is if you said, well, this is where I am and this is where I want to go. What are the ways that I can get there? Hmm. You know, I'm currently a high school sophomore, junior, senior, and I want to be a musician. Well, college could be on that path, but so could starting a band or, yeah. you know, whatever. Right. So lots of different ways to become a musician. And in the end, 
most people don't care if or where you went to college if you can actually you know play the music whatever that means yeah and that's the reality right or again as business owners we hire graphic designers and other people with various skill sets most of us don't care where you learn the how you did it right if you can work, set up the google system for me and you have google certificates but you didn't go to college that's fine i don't really care if you can get the job done that's what we want yeah, the um, efficacy on the flip the side, if you set. want to be president, right? Exactly. On the, if you want to be president of the United States, well, then maybe you probably should pick an Ivy League school and go there because you're going to need those connections 20 and 30 and 40 years down the line as your career grows. So, you know, there's pluses and minuses to all paths, but the whole idea that college is right for everyone isn't very good. And then getting back to your majors, well, it's like, okay, we'll pick majors that are appropriate for your particular student. What do they want to do? You can be successful in all kinds of different majors. Of course, many, if you talk to a lot of people out there, a lot of the jobs that we have today weren't majors 10 and 20 years ago. Yeah. And a lot of the jobs we're going to have 10 and 20 years from now, you can't study in college because they don't exist yet. So there's, you know, pe there's always people learning new stuff and Lots of people make that hard left turn in their career where they studied this for a while. Maybe they did that for 10 or 20 years and then they change careers. Yeah. Pivot. All that stuff is really hard to bake into a plan and it's a reality. But most people, if you ask them, don't regret how they got where they're going unless they start talking about, well, this crazy amount of debt. I regret that. I regret that piece. Oh, yeah. Um, in, in and that's... Uh, and I think that's the challenge of we're asking 17 year olds to plan their life and choose careers and that type of thing. Totally. I Another important piece of college is when you study college, some majors, nursing, elementary education, what are you going to do with that degree? You're going to become a nurse or a teacher. And by the way, if you want to be a nurse or a teacher, you pretty much have no choice but to go study nursing or go study elementary ed. They're very linked together. Yeah, the path now, is super linear. There's there's few variants that get you there. Exactly. Whereas if you want to sell MRI machines or you want to become an entrepreneur, there's many paths. And if you have a history major, where does that lead? Well, sometimes history professor or high school history teacher, but a lot of times it leads to selling MRI machines or some other unrelated career. And it isn't necessarily wrong. It's just different. Yeah. And I, I think, at least just from my experience, I, I feel everyone goes with an idea of maybe what they wanted. And so I, I imagine that's got to be so hard to, for 17 and for their parents. Well, I think I want to be a doctor. And then you go to the school and you go down this path and you're like, oh man, OCAM is really hard. Maybe I don't want to do that. <laughs> Talk to me. I'm sure you sit with families in this. How do you feel just in the decision? Because it is a big investment and it does seed a lot for a young person's life. Have you, how do you feel about gap years for someone graduating high school before they go and make those decisions? Yeah, I think gap years is a, maybe even a little underutilized. I'm a, I wouldn't say I'm a fan, but I say we're appropriate, right? And that's, mm -hmm. again, the challenge of there's lots of ways to do this. Um. I had a few families that I was working with. COVID was an excuse to throw in a gap year. And I would say it was successful most of the time where they didn't really want to go to college during COVID. So they lose the social you know, they scene, delayed a year and found, found other things to do. But there's lots of gap year opportunities now. And there's lots, some of the, uh, some countries, you know, just about everybody takes a gap year because of required military service or various religious opportunities. So it can be very successful. There's nothing wrong with it as long as you do something productive. I think. Yeah. I think that that's the for key, a lot of right? kids. <laughs> Don't sit and play right? video games or Fortnite. You got to go, you know, take the apprenticeship opportunity with the sector that you're feeling out, you know, go shadow these people or get in the room with them and go work under somebody that has the life you imagine you want. Right. Exactly. Or go work for the Peace Corps or the national parks or, whatever but do something and most colleges would will, will respect whatever you do there's no right or wrong again other than the, i didn't do much i just sat around and 
yeah. waited for life to happen to me. Hopefully don't offend anybody, that's, but I would say that's wrong. <laughs> right. Exactly. But yeah. So, I mean, I think that's the big challenge, right? Is that, you know, what we're up against is, is expensive. It's hard to, hard to deal with from uh, what do I want to be when I grow up and all the kind of the soft challenges that we're up against. Um, but then of course, the other side of it is the very technical of, well, if I do this, will I get more aid or less or, yeah, and that's, you know, how do we deal with that's a paying for this and piece of the puzzle? I you had something a guest on one of your I can't remember if it was you or, or the guest brought it up talking about just looking at kind of like the net value or the net price of of cost that a lot of parents aren't thinking about whether that's you know that cost that college where it's located, the housing, tuition, all the different fees and different things associated. What are some of the things that you see when parents and a kid are sitting down saying, "Hey, my kid wants to go to the school because in my experience, it was just, hey, go take the test, go get the grades and then see who'll take you <laughs> and then figure out how to pay for that later. <laughs> and it was like, do whatever you can to get right. in that big school with the biggest name and the biggest program. But you had something that you guys have almost algorithmically understood. Hey, you know, this degree can't go to this schools or these jobs like the, the likelihood that you get your ROI isn't there. Talk to me a little bit about that. I think that's fascinating. Right. Well, I think some of the the challenge again is it's very expensive and how are you going to pay for it is a big piece of the puzzle. And for a lot of families, the the choice really is how can we do this at the lowest cost possible because we just don't have the resources. Mm -hmm. But then you get to the next level up where it's like, okay, I could pay more for college, but now the question is, should I pay more for college? Is there a really a return on investment if I go to the local state school for 25,000 or I go to this other private school for 50,000 or 75,000? Am I getting something that's three times better if I spend three times as much? Mm -hmm. Often the answer is no. I mean, most of us probably realize that. Sometimes the answer is yes. Um, so I think that factors into it. And it really boils down, I think for a lot of families, as far as you know, what what cash flow and what can you afford? And the reality is, there's lots of families that can't afford to spend money on college. I always use the analogy of you know, if you're giving up the lake home because you want to spend crazy amounts of money on college, okay, well that's your decision, right? You you're going to spend your money somehow. If education is important, great. Yeah. But if you're going to blow up your retirement to spend crazy amounts of money on college, that's a different situation. And again, some families will do it knowingly. I think the real challenge is a lot of families will do it unknowingly. It's like, we didn't know what we were getting into and this happened and then that happened. And then we ended up signing up for a bunch of loans. And now that we got to deal with all these loans, we're realizing that this is really, you know, having a big impact on our financial future. Yeah. Where they, they go um, down that path and then start polling once they've already committed their, their kid or whatever to that school. And they're like, man, this is, this is way more than we, right. we anticipated. Right. So I encourage families, one of the biggest challenges is knowing what the true cost is. You mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, net cost of a minute ago. Yeah. So, you know, to get into that, right? So the the standard average state school is about 27,000 a year. And that's tuition, room and board, books, fees, beer and pizza. The whole cost of a typical college education. Now the average private school is about 57,000. And again, these are published list price, okay. tuition, room and board, books, fees, beer and pizza. But that's not what you actually pay. What you actually pay is the list price minus whatever aid you receive. Now, the average aid at a state school is about six or seven or 8,000. The average at a private school is in the 20,000s now, 21, 23, hmm. something like that. And for some families, it can be substantially more. And what, what's the so distinguishment there that gives so much more aid to a private school? What, what are the elements that play there? Well, the, just the higher price tag, right? And and the dynamics of how, what the way college works. So to use an example, let's say you could go to the flagship state school. What state are you in right now? Uh, Missouri. Okay, so you let's say you can go to the flagship school in Missouri or you could go to St. Louis University, both nearby, whatever. And you're saying, okay, how are we going to do this? Well, St. Louis University, say, is 65,000. The local state school is 
25,000. That is a tough sell to say, hey, you know, we're going to be, you know, double, almost triple what the other schools are. So they they offer aid, especially for families that have merit. You know, so if you have a rock star student, they're likely to get aid based on their academics or based on need. So if your family needs help, they may provide it. Okay. Now that leaves out some families who say, well, we don't need it. And our students not that strong. They may have token awards even for that student or they say, all right, well, we'll give you 10,000 off. So, if, you know, and then people would argue, well, if you're going to give everybody at least 10,000 off, why, why even just lower your price by 10,000? And it's the, the psychology of people love to get a scholarship. So it's, it's, it's they raise the price the by 10,000 and they reduce it by 10,000. <laughs> exactly. Right. Just like you can't waste that coupon. You get a coupon, you got to go spend it. Whereas had you not gotten the coupon, you just would have gone without. And that's, that's you know, so there's a little bit of that going on where they are literally trying to figure out how to market and get you to buy just like everybody else in the world. Yeah. Well, the, the, you brought up something just with all this, it kind of just brought up a thought. Like, let's say, you know, I'm sitting with my kid and obviously this is late. We haven't done, I know I definitely want to get into some of the things you can do to prepare for your kids college costs, but we're, we're looking at a couple schools, just like your example. How can somebody meet with you? Like, I'm sure this is what you guys do, right? Is help them understand that situation right there where, Hey, that price tag might actually be more, but with your merit, with certain grants and scholarships or whatever you can get in. And then the career you're looking for, if you had these connections and you got this ROI out of going to this school, this actually is less expensive to you versus going here if you're trying to go to this space. Yes. Yeah. I think one of the biggest challenges, you don't know what the price of the school is going to be and the way the system has been until the very end, right? So you apply to a bunch of schools, they determine if they're going to offer you need-based aid and merit aid. And just before you pick a school, that's when you get the actual final price. So we, one of the things that we help families with is predicting the prices well ahead of time. So you can say, well, if these all these schools are going to be crazy expensive, we should apply to different schools. And, you know, some schools are, you know, guaranteed that they're going to meet everybody's needs. So if you're a high need family, finding schools that meet need may make sense. So when if you're, you've got a really strong student that's going to get a lot of merit aid, finding a school where your student would be considered a rock star may be appropriate. So when you're when you're sitting with a family and helping them understand, hey, you know, get get the bang for your buck. Let's go target this ROI. You guys are kind of counseling. Go apply for if they have a couple high pick schools. Go apply for a bunch of schools that may you may be the A player or the B player, like in the top percentile of what that school is looking for. Right. Exactly. And if you're targeting merit aid as an example, mm -hmm. if you can just barely get accepted, kind of by definition, you're not a strong student for that school. Sure. Okay. <laughs> but you take the average person that gets accepted at Notre Dame or Harvard, they're a really strong student, just not at Notre Dame or Harvard. They yeah. could go to that no name private school down the street that most people haven't heard of and get a full ride. But here's the challenge. If you take a kid that gets accepted at Notre Dame, gets a strong scholarship at Marquette or St. Louis University, or gets a full ride at some little school that nobody's ever heard of, where do they want to go? They don't want to go to the school just because it's free. Mm -hmm. They might want to go to the mid-tier mid school, or they might want to go all the way to the top school. And I think that's a matter of expectation of, is Notre Dame or Harvard worth 75,000 a year if you could go to some other school for 30,000 or 40,000 or some other school for zero. And I think that's the challenge. Now to make it even more complicated, schools like Harvard and Notre Dame and Stanford are very generous with need-based aid. Hmm. Stanford just put out a press release th th over this past year saying that if the family income is below 100,000, Stanford will be free. Zero tuition, zero room and board. You just got to make it in. If the family's income's one, under 150, then tuition will be zero and room and board will be on some sort of sliding scale. So you may have to pay some towards room and board. Hmm. So what that means for most families is if your income is below, certainly below 100 and 
probably under 150, Stanford is probably your lowest cost option compared to even the state schools. Now, here's the challenge. Stanford is highly selective. Yeah, you got to get in. <laughs> your kid's got to be a rock star in order to get accepted. But if you, again, if they have those kind of academics, don't let Stanford's $85,000 a year price tag scare you off because, again, if you show a need, they will be very generous. That, that's interesting. It, are you seeing, just it, as you're dealing with lots of schools right now, is there is that pretty similar in some capacity to a lot of schools doing something kind of at that 100000 150000 threshold where there's more aid available to those families, or that's pretty unique? That's unique. That's the top dogs. That's the Harvard, Yale. Got it. Stanford, University of Chicago, I mean, the top tw- top 25, top 50, 10 of schools. So okay. that's what, what's the, kind of the threshold for the, the normal school that most students are attending? You know, the University of Missouri, University of Utah, University of Kansas, their, their local state school. Right. Well, I guess I don't quite understand the question, but it, in essence, yeah. you can put schools into different buckets. You've got the highly elite selective schools. You've got the flagship state schools. You've got the kind of the mid-tier private schools. And each of those groups do things a little bit differently. And uh, so your strategies would change depending on which school, those types of schools you're targeting. Again, if you have an academic rock star and the family is just an average, you know, $150,000 a year earnings, well, then all these really high end schools will be very generous and they are certainly need to be considered. If the family earns a half million or a million a year, you know, for certain you're going to pay full price at Stanford and Yale and Harvard because they don't offer any merit aid at all. There is no way to get merit aid. If your income is that high, you're guaranteed to have to pay full price. Wow. Now, again, if you're earning a half million or a million full price is still possible. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying, don't be surprised when you say, oh, well, my kid got into Harvard and we, it was full price. And they also got into XYZ private school and they offered him a $25,000 or a $50,000 merit scholarship. It's like, that may be true, but you know, going in that Harvard is not offering a merit scholarship. Hmm. The best you can hope for is get accepted yeah. and then be considered for need-based aid. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. And just... Across these, you, you said some interesting. Every category kind of have a different strategy, so it that makes the game even more complicated. <laughs> Knowing as a family, yes, you know who are you targeting, or what's the likelihood my kid? At what point do you say, you know, parents and their kids should start talking about realistically? You know, okay, you're performing this way in high school. These are probably some of the schools your your test scores are looking this way, like. When, when should this conversation start getting really serious? Um, I don't know that I would say it's kind of ramps up in seriousness, starting with freshman year in high school. Okay. And maybe even a little bit before, right? I mean, if you have a kid that's on his way to being that rock star, you know, he's already been, you know, top of the class in eighth grade and you, you know, encourage him to stay at the top of the class. Yep. Because that's how you get into, Stanford and Yale and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, so there's some things that matter freshman and sophomore year as far as academics and path and that kind of stuff. But it certainly isn't the, you know, on the flip side, you you know, some people say, oh, no, you know, I got to get into the right pre-K so I can get into the right kindergarten so I can get into the right grade school so I can get into the right high school so I can go and get into the right college so that my kid can be a success. That is a crazy amount of pressure. And you can certainly, you know, and there are people that think that way and operate that way, but that's not the only way. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, you know, that's two sides of the same coin is there's nothing wrong with doing that. There's nothing right with doing it either. There's other ways that, you know, so I don't want to say that, you know, if you haven't figured it all out by freshman year of high school, you're on your way to failure. Yeah. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> all I'm saying is if, especially parents, right? Because there's things that when you do college planning, Another way to look at it is it's this project throughout your high school career. The students have things to do. They've got to, you know, choose their courses, figure out what they want to be when they grow up. They're going to have to take the testing. They're going to have to put up the grades. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to write the essays. And then there's the stuff that the parents do, right? Generally, the parents are going to figure out financial aid. 
Parents are going to set up a, a saving as an investment plan if that's what they want to do. The parents are going to have to figure out how to be fair if they've got multiple kids. The parents are going to have to do all the financial stuff. And then there's the stuff you do together. You visit colleges. You, you know, maybe you choose to work with tutors or not. Or you choose to hire someone like me or not. All that kind of stuff where maybe you need test prep help. Well, parents can hire, hire tutors to help with test prep. But if the student is going to participate, it's a waste of money. So you both have to be on board with some of these things. You brought up something now, interesting. Just um, I, I wanted, I think that's a really, really key piece. Obviously, students got to do their piece, but parents got to do their their part because they're usually, I would say, what, like 90, at least 90% of the time, they're going to help in some way. And maybe they still take out loans or do whatever. But when when ideally, like, you've been in this space 20 years when ideally if a parent says, Hey, I'm most likely going to have, I hope my kids go to college. I hope they experience, you know, what I experience or go get those degrees or have the ability. I want my kid to have that option. When should a parent, uh, start preparing for that? And what things can a parent do to, from an investing standpoint, prepare to actually be, have their wherewithal when their kid makes that decision to go to school. Right. So that, now we get into what I would call early stage planning and late stage planning. Mm -hmm. So early stage planning is we've got kids in grade school or middle school or even newborns or, hey, we're pregnant. Let's start saving for college. That's all legitimate early stage planning where you just need to say, well, if education is going to be expensive and it's going to be ultimately need to be 10 or 20 percent of our budget. Well, if that's true, well, then you got to start factoring that in. Other people might say, well, it's only going to be a couple percent or we're not paying at all. There's no right or wrong. But some families, especially if you as, you know, middle income and up families where you do have a little extra money, it's like, well, if I spend $7,000 a year on this soccer club. Is that getting them as far along as if I just buy a, go to the $3,000 a year soccer club and put 4,000 in his college account? Those are the kind of decisions you might need, should be thinking about when you've got a second grader or a fifth grader or whatever. Yeah. And just, and then just in general, a, maybe we can save a couple hundred a month per kid or something like that. And that, that's interesting because obviously I have people all the time and I'm, I'm bit, you know, obviously I think anyone who's in the investing circle, you know, start early, start now, get consistent. And then you, you hear all the different amounts, you know, to your Roth, to your IRA, what is like an amount, if somebody's thinking that early and they're actually prepping ahead, what is pretty common if a kid's going to go get a normal undergrad, what should people be thinking about or estimating to put away? Obviously you're kind of forecasting 18 ish years in the future. What do I, what, what is like a normal amount that your world is kind of estimating that people need to start putting away to prepare for stuff like that. Right. And that is the, if I knew that answer, I, you know, I'd be <laughs> a millionaire, but the, be the wizard. <laughs> I mean, cause here's the reality, right? We don't know that your student is going to college. We don't know that the college process 18 years from now is going to be anything like it is now. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of predictions that things will get disrupted and maybe they will, but you know, a good rule of thumb is if you look backwards, you know, if you had a high school senior today, if you would have saved a couple hundred dollars a month consistently from the time they were born until now, you would have a good chunk of money. And I can't remember the exact numbers, but it would be roughly a third of what a state school costs. Hmm. So at $200 a month, you have a third in the bank. You could pay another third out of cash flow, and then the student could pay and borrow another third. And it would be a pretty seamless, comfortable process where a state school was well within striking distance. Gotcha. But here's the reality. If you think back to what it was when you had a newborn, you know, or like, you know, I, there's one point I had three kids under four years old. <laughs> so I had a almost four year old, a two year old and a newborn. And the idea of that we're saving 200 a month per child while paying crazy amounts on daycare wasn't a realistic situation. So I think that's the challenge, right? Is yes, we should do it, but most of us didn't do it mm -hmm. when we get there. Um, and then, so we, we have to make up for that. Now, again, for a lot of families, your career starts growing, you know, and many parents of college age kids have, you know, got 10 or 15 or 20 years in their career and it's starting to 
blossom, right? They're getting those raises. They're moving into management. They're all of a sudden they're gaining more income. And now college is getting more real, even if they didn't save quite as much. So there's that possibility as well. But, you know, again, a, a good rule of thumb, if you could save a couple hundred a month Don't per student, difference. you know, that wouldn't hurt. And some family, you know, and some families have, you know, maybe a one-time event, maybe an inheritance or something where they could say, hey, let's just put 25000 in now and let it ride. And then we don't have to add anything to it. We'll just see how it goes. That, that's a good start or something like that. So okay. there's no automatic right answer here, um, but do what you can. Um, now, what I spend a lot of time with families on is what I would call late stage planning. So we've talked about early stage. That makes the most late sense. I would assume is, that's where most people are at, right? Is Oh shit. Right. Exactly. Here it comes. <laughs> now exactly. what can we do? Now you've got a high school freshman, sophomore, junior, and now the real work begins because now you literally are visiting schools and trying to figure out need-based aid and merit aid and testing and all that stuff. And you may have done a great job in early stage and saved a big pile of money. But even if you have, you still have a lot of work to do because you're still got to do all the process. Mm. Now, you know, so that's the late stage. Ideally, sophomore year, you want to hit it hard. And if you've got complications, you know, if you're a business owner, if you own rental property, if you've got that high flying student, uh, divorce and blended families, inheritances, things that make your life complicated, then maybe even freshman year, you can start working on it. So talk, talk now, here's to me the a challenge. A lot that, of parents just... say, we can't do it as a freshman year. We can't do that because our kid doesn't know what they want to be when they grow up. And I'm not saying that the student has to start freshman year. I'm yeah. saying parents can start their stuff, you know, kind of circling back around to some of the stuff the parents do. They can do it whether the student is ready or not. You know, do we understand how need-based aid works? Do we understand how merit-based aid works? What's the family budget? What are we willing to spend? You know, I think if we haven't started a savings program yet, maybe we can start one now. You just and brought yes, up. it would have been better had we started a long time ago, but every year you can save takes a little bit of pressure off. You you just said a, a couple of things that I'm sure as I'm just thinking, I, I'd imagine anyone who's got a kid going to school in the next couple of years or maybe even school right now probably didn't ask those questions and is like feeling the heat of not. You said, hey, you know, what can we afford, right? What should somebody be budgeting for their kid based off where they're at? Like in those late stage, need-based and merit-based I, I could almost guarantee just based off of the interactions I have, and I'm sure you could empathize with this. Most people don't know what types of scholarship programs or grant programs or need-based and merit-based programs there are. What are the way that people can get educated to know how they can tackle this? Other than obviously following your podcast and getting all over their, your material. <laughs> right. I don't know of a lot of other ways necessarily. I mean, there's certainly some good books out there and, but just getting involved and understanding what you're getting into and, um, you know, understanding what is the local state school cost and what, what, you know, what programs are there and talking with the school counselors and, or, and, or the colleges, you know, some States, the colleges are very expensive and other States, you know, the state colleges are more reasonable. Some States offer some pretty substantial, aid, whether it's need-based or merit-based or both, where, you know, some states, if your student has a, you know, a B, B plus average or better, a 3.0 or better, or whatever it might be, there might be a little bit of a scholarship at all the state schools. And if they have even better grades, then they might be a bigger scholarship at all the state schools. Okay. So when, when would you like to find out that you need to have a 3.0 to get the scholarship? Sophomore year or end of senior year when you've got, you've just put up a 2.96 and you realize that I'm you know, 0.04 away from $5,000 a year scholarship. You know, that's a tough pill to swallow. Because hey, had you known, you probably would have cracked the whip a little bit harder and maybe you'd have crossed the line. But I think that's the challenge is most people don't know what they're up against. In and it's easy to look back and say, well, there's all kinds of things we could have and should have done. And, you know, my job is to help people, you know, get it done instead of looking back and saying, I regret what I did. Well, that's what I, I love that you do this because I, just from experience, I'm four or five years out of school now, but I, I have 
from my grade, I, I know so many people who definitely did not plan this way or didn't come from an affluent family and just took on exorbitant amount of debt, took five years to finish school, you know, took another year or whatever. And their degree in the space and the opportunities that opened, it, it, it didn't have an ROI that seems, you know, hundred thousand dollars in debt. I, I look at the averages and I, I swear everyone I know has way more than what the averages say anywhere on Google. Everyone I know has way more yep. debt than that. And I don't know if that's just, they go to school for longer than they thought or what happens, but I love that you, you do have this resource cause it is, it is a huge issue. Um, you said something, right? You said some state schools have stuff for like a grade point average. Are you identifying that most of the merit-based stuff is GPA? How much of it's testing? What is, where does the merit-based, like the skills or the things that kids need to pay attention to or parents need to pay attention for their kids that's going to give them the best, I guess, return? Right. Yeah. So there's been a big push now to more holistically evaluate students. Okay. So as an example, there used to be the um, National Merit Scholar System. Mm. And the National Merit Scholar was based on a test you took your junior year. And if you scored in the top couple percent, then you could be a National Merit semifinalist and then ultimately a National Merit finalist. And it, it all started with doing really well on that test. Well, then when COVID came along and a whole bunch of kids never had the opportunity to take the test, they realized that they had to change the system because it all was so relying on that test. And then testing is starting to become a little more optional where a lot of colleges are saying, you know, we don't necessarily need test scores. Mm -hmm. We'll evaluate you some other way. So because there's this big move away from tests, all of a sudden national merit said, you know what, we can't base it just on a test anymore because a lot of students aren't bothering to take the test. So now what are we going to do? So they've gone to a more holistic looking at more factors than just how well you can score on a test, looking at things like grades and essays. And it's a much more complicated process because of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the, I think was the, in the past, that was the advantage. And there's still some of this where a college right on their website will say, you know, if you've got a GPA like this and a test score like that, your scholarship will be 10,000. If you have better scores like this and like that, your scholarship will be 15,000. And then if you want the $20,000 scholarship, here's the line for that. Okay. And then now, just some colleges put that out there on their website. You can go look it up. Other colleges, they have that in their desk drawer and they use it. They just don't tell you where the lines are. Okay. So you submit a 3.26 and a, you know, a 30 ACT and they pull open the drawer and they say, oh, that's a 25,000. So you, what they don't tell you is, oh, you are just a hair away from 30,000. Too and, bad. And from those, those <laughs> you, know, you schools, don't know where the line was. From those schools, is there any way to find out what that line is? Like in before? Well, yeah. And again, they may share it. You just got to dig. They just may not put it on their website. Or the, the other challenge, I think, is for a lot of schools, they will adjust those numbers as needed to, to make their life work, whatever that means. Right. So, we're going to have to give a few more scholarships out to get more kids to come. That's what we're going to have to do. So they, they're willing to do it or give out less because we don't have the budget this year. So they don't want to, you know, again, sometimes they don't want to put it out there because they don't want to be required to do it because they might, they might need to change their mind or, or, you know, fudge things a little bit. Makes sense. Um, and then, so, and again, so every, every school does a little different and that's part of the process that parents, you know, as your freshman, sophomore year, junior year, that when you're visiting colleges and you're starting to learn about it, those are the kind of questions you ask is like, well, what does it take to get a scholarship in our state based on the state program? So what does it take to get a scholarship at these types of schools based on our student? What does it take to, how much will the scholarship be? And does it bring the price within reason? Hmm. Um, you know, in the end, for a lot of families, the low cost state school is going to be the price to beat. Okay. That's kind of the standard. Now, right. You know, so let's say you can go to the local state school for 25,000. You can go to some out of state schools for, you know, the list price of 40, but they give you some scholarships. So they're also 25,000. And you can go to a bunch of private schools that start at 50 and 60 and 70, but because of scholarships, they come down to 25,000. That's not realistic, but that's a hypothetical situation, right? So now yeah. they all cost the same. You pick the one you like. 
that's almost never the reality. What <laughs> happens is you can go to these schools for 25,000, but this one's 28 and this one's 32. And then these are 42. And on this one over here, 72, of course. And then most people are saying, yeah, that's the one my kid's going to like is the one that's 72, of course. Um, and then you kind of go from there. It's like, well, we limit the one that's 72, but as long as we're in for 25, are we willing to go to 28? Most parents would say yes if we see value in it. Yeah. Well, if you're willing to go to 28, do I hear 32? <laughs> well, probably as long as we see value in it. Well, as long as we're at 32, do I hear 36? Right. <laughs> so there's that slippery slope of, you know, when do we, where do we draw the line and what makes sense? And I think the the thinking about it ahead of time because it's extremely emotional situation. Oh yeah. There's nothing too good for my kid is the typical mantra that we hear until the, now we have to make good on that comment, which is writing bigger checks. Which and is, then we regret that process. And you, you obviously, I think we, you've talked a lot about every specific school has obviously their standards and the scholarships that are available and kind of evaluating that kind of just obviously some late stage stuff. I know there's a ton of like third party scholarships available for students. How do people find those or what are the resources or how much money is there really available, you know, through the, all the essay competitions and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. There's, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars available in scholarships from outside sources. So there's a lot of money, um, but it's not unlimited. It's not going to pay for all the school for everybody. So that's one of those things where, is you're that a very compete useful for your piece of the pie. Piece and if you can get planning, like, is that something you guys are accounting but, for or counseling for? Like, hey, you know, there's this local state bank, yes. whatever. Right. I mean, the reality of it is, you know, so I always tell people I, I had one student many years ago. He applied to 40 scholarships and he won seven for thirty nine thousand hmm. dollars. I've had many students, you know, get the presidential scholarship or get whatever type of scholarship from the college themselves, where it was one award or two awards. But they're the minority. That's rare. They're the ones that, you know, right. It's rare for a student to apply to 40 scholarships. Yeah. I don't know anyone. It's rare that. for <laughs> the student to get that top prize, to be one of the top 25 students at the college that gets invited to the interview and then does well in the interview and ultimately wins one of those presidential scholars. Mm. And it's not impossible. But I think you need to have a plan B in most cases. And it all goes back to that starting early and how much time are you going to spend on this? When you talk about 40 scholarship applications, that's, you know, that's not something you knock out on a Sunday afternoon. No. That's many, many Sunday afternoons. That's a job for years, potentially. Now, if you win $39,000, it's a well-paying job mm -hmm. and well worth it. But if you don't win the scholarships, then you know, then it's not worth it. And the reality of it is most people don't have the time budgeted in and the know-how. And again, if only 1% of the 2 million kids do it, that's still thousands and thousands of people that are doing this. Yes. Yeah, so for still many, steep. many families, right? Exactly. And it's, and it's just a challenge of if we had more time, we might've done it, but that's what I typically see is by the time you do all the other stuff well, there's just not a lot of time and bandwidth left over, especially for that high achieving student that's got AP everything and yeah. is taking the tests and is involved in sports and clubs and they're, you know, doing test prep and they're saying, oh, and, and I have to apply to 10 schools and you want me to apply to 20 scholarships on top of the 10 colleges I'm applying to? Where, when am I doing that? Where, where's the time for that? Well, I think even and, interesting, and you probably have better experience of this. I'm just speaking from experience of what I remember my classmates and friends and people in my social circle. I feel like I was in a lot of AP classes. I did a ton of prep to make sure my ACT was good and you know my academics and my athletics were where they needed to be. And I feel like most of my peers that were kind of on par with me academically or athletically were actually thinking ahead on all that. It was a lot of my friends who we're kind of just, I don't know what I want to do that I feel like is, is in the majority of, well, I'm just going to go to school, but I have no idea why, um, that ended up with these mm -hmm. exorbitant amounts for those people. And I feel like that that's a big group of people. 
that are just not sure what college is going to give them, but they're going to go like, that's just the next step. Right. What, what are, what's kind of the best advice for them financially or planful wise that they can be thinking about, or as they pick a school, like what, what, what are the keys that they should be thinking of? Right. Well, and I think, and again, it really is a kind of a per family plan, but you know, if you can qualify for need-based aid, if you can qualify for merit aid, you certainly want to take that into account where, again, a lot of times there are private schools that will come in at a reasonably close price to the state schools. Mm -hmm. So a lot of families out there say, well, we're only going to consider state schools because those are what we can afford, which is a valid statement. But if you could find private schools that also come in at a similar price, would you consider them too? Well, yes. Well, then you got to figure out, well, which ones are likely to come in at a similar price and then pursue them as well. So you can yeah. expand it and include private schools. But the reality is there's some schools that aren't going to be competitive. So you either take them off the list or allow the student to apply, but just say, you know, again, we can apply wherever we want. It doesn't mean we're going to go. Yeah. We, the money has to come into, into a, the right area as well in order for us to actually choose the school, you know, and some parents will say, well, then we're not even going to apply because if we, that's a slippery slope. And if they fall in love with it, we'll have a hard time saying no. And we're screwed. next thing you know, we're going to right? don't walk on the Porsche or the BMW part uh, yep. auto lot. If you don't want to buy a BMW or a Porsche, cause you, you are going to fall in love. So yeah, they're beautiful, right? Yeah. The best you, way to avoid that is to just not, not go there. Um, some people will use that theory, right? Of, yeah, these schools are beautiful and they're beautiful campuses and wonderful programs. And if we look at them too much, we're going to end up wanting one. So our best bet is to stay away from it. Other families are like, no, I can, I can resist. I'll, I'll consider everything yeah. and do it in a particular way. So there's no right or wrong there. That, that brings but again, up uh, just something that you said, it just triggered a thought. I think this is, this is something I, I feel like a lot of people probably find themselves in this position. Um, when you're a parent or you're, you're the child and they do know, right? Like, Hey, I, I'm sure most kids would love to drive that type of car. Right. But you get the kid that says, you know, I know I want to go to this private school and they're telling mom and dad, Hey, I really want to go to this school. I got accepted. Income isn't there, but the degree is just throw one out like, uh, psychology, right? So they're going to spend a ton of money for a place where there maybe isn't a ton of high paying development out of there. And they know that they're in that spot. Where do you feel? Is it, is it wise for parents who have to do this? Like what's that line of telling, Hey, we got to find a different school for you to go pursue that. Is, is that a case that you advise in places? Oh, absolutely. I think again, a lot of people get hung up on the name brand. Hmm. Uh, situation when it comes to college, like, well, I can go to, I went to this school or that school and it was crazy expensive. And it's like, if you really need that name brand, you can go there for grad school. You can get your MBA from Harvard, you you know, yeah. or your MD from Harvard or whatever. And that carries just as much cash as your undergrad. So you can go to the undergrad at the state school and get your next degree from wherever. It doesn't have to be you get your undergrad from an expensive school. Um, and a lot of these schools will take strong kids from anywhere. Um, and then, of course, you know, like I said, so there's lots of paths. When you start getting into the grad school discussions, well, you know, some degrees you pay a lot of money for it and they don't let you work. If you want, you know, studying to be a doctor or mm. physician assistant or a number of the vets, you know, they, they discourage work. You've got to study hard and that's your focus. And you end up borrowing a lot of money. But getting your PhD in physics or chemistry, you could be a TA or an RA and never pay any tuition. You just kind of work your way through grad school. Mm. Um, Makes sense. So there can be some st substantial differences depending on what you're doing and where you're going and, and how it works. And for a lot of the you know, other important thing is they don't require mom and dad to sign the financial aid forms anymore. Grad school is not based on mom and dad's assets and income. Grad school is based on the student's assets and income. First of all, the second piece is there's not a lot of scholarships for grad school. Again, you can work your way with, yeah. you know, RA and TA and that kind of stuff, but there's not like there is, you know, the typical school that offers a $50,000 scholarship at an $80,000 school, that stuff is gone. 
that doesn't happen very much in grad school. But you again, you could be the RA at that same school or TA and have a great, or you end up just borrowing $80,000. And theoretically, when you're an MD from an expensive school, you're going to make good money and be able to pay it back. Well, Brad, obviously we could probably talk for hours and hours. I know after I look through a lot of your content, there is an unbelievable plethora of resources and strategies and tactics that parents and students can prepare just kind of in, in closing from all of your experience, if there was like two or three, just these are the big keys. If you could start today, what should parents and, and students like those takeaways, if you could give them, you know, just two or three things to go prepare for this, the task of taming the, the cost of college. Right. I, I think there's a couple of key things. One is start earlier than you think you need to, because if mm -hmm. you can spread this out a little bit, it's a lot less pressure. Um, I get a lot of those calls, right? Where you know, we're late in the junior year, early senior year, and we're overwhelmed and we don't know what to do. And, you know, in the back of my mind, the first thing I think of is, well, you should have called me a year ago. <laughs> um, but of course it's water under the bridge. We do what we can, but that's the reality is it's a lot, there's a lot to do. You need to start earlier than what we used to do. So, I, you know, a lot of parents didn't start till late junior year or senior year. I don't think that's early enough anymore with all the different aspects that are go into a good college plan. I would target sophomore year okay. to where, especially for the parents, again, the student may not be mature enough. They may, you know, you may have to wait for them to grow up a little for some of the aspects, but parents can get started um, relatively early. Um, I guess the other next thing that I encourage pe people to understand is there's a, a lot of, you know, what I would call tactics or strategies, you know, if you do this, you'll get a little bit more need-based aid. If you do that, you'll save a little bit of taxes and all that stuff is important and you need to do it, but it's, you know, it's very case by case where, you know, here's a strategy. It works great, but it only applies if you own a business or it only applies if you're divorced or it only applies if you're going to these types of schools. So there's kind of two steps to the process. One is find a school at a good net price whatever that means for your family, and then pay for that school as efficiently as possible. So again, there's a lot of tactics around saving and investing around maximizing need-based aid and merit aid and cash flow strategies and tax strategies and all kinds of different things that you can do. And those are all great. And they may apply no matter what school you pick. So you, you start with a, the top line price you get a school down to a net price that makes sense for you. And then from there, you figure out how to pay for that school as, as efficiently as possible. Obviously, I glossed over a whole lot of detail <laughs> when we get into actually, well, how do yeah. you do that? And uh, that's where, again, things like managing your assets and your cash flow and your income so that need-based aid works out well for you. Or for some families, it's a lost cause and you're not going to get need-based aid. Then you work on tax strategies and saving strategies. And hmm. so there's lots of things you can do. And as you mentioned, you know, I've got a hundred and some podcasts and I haven't covered it all yet. So it's not something we're going to knock out in an hour. It's something you have to work at, you know, as a process, you know, I guess that's, and that's the last thing is college planning is a process. You don't sit down one Sunday afternoon and make a plan. You sit down and say, all right, well, here's what we know so far. Here's where we need to learn more. Here's what we can do for the next few months. And then once you've done those things, then it's like, okay, well, based on what we've learned, here's the next step. Here's the more things we can do and different things we can do to kind of advance the ball. Well, Brad, I, there's, like I said, there's, there's so much to this. And I think your tips and your expertise, this is such a niche space that, you know, e even in all the interviews I do and personal finance, I think this is a specific sector that, can be so big for people or so harmful to their careers and their life if they incur too much debt or don't go to the right schools at the right time or they do it the wrong way or if they do it the right way, it could be huge. So for everybody listening, where can people find you, keep track of you and, and pour and get access to this, this information, the things that you're teaching about funding college? Right. Yeah, everything is at my website, tamingthehighcostofcollege.com. 
So we've got a website and a free newsletter. There's also a lot of free resources, including things like a financial aid calculator and other um, resources that you can use to plan with. Scholarship Guide for Busy Parents talks about some of the scholarship we've, you know, we've covered a little bit here, kind of goes into more depth on the types of scholarships and how that works. Um, and we even have a um, college money report where if you give us your academic profile, financial profile, it'll help you estimate the cost of some of the colleges. So there's a lot more wow. tools out there now. So we're starting to share those out and hopefully, you know, people can use them whether, you know, and again, if you want to work with me or talk with me directly, our phone number, and you can send us, you know, schedule appointments through the website, call us, whatever you'd like to do. Thanks for coming on, Brad. We'll attach all the links for Brad into the show notes so you guys can keep track of him, get access to his resources. There's a ton of good information. I went through his podcast. There's a ton of good insights out there. For everyone listening, we'll catch you next time on The Money Game. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit us up on social media. Real money. Real money. Money is the answer. Y'all be cool. And we'll see you next time on The Money Game. Money. Money. Yes! Disclosures. The information provided to you today is for educational purposes only. It is not intended to be specific recommendations or advice. Please consult with a qualified professional before acting on any of this material. Investing involves risk. Depending on the types of investments, there may be varying degrees of risk. Investors should be prepared to bear loss, including total loss of principal. 529 College Savings Plan Disclosures Investors should carefully consider investment objectives, risk, charges, and expenses. This information and other important information are contained in the fund prospectuses, summary prospectuses, and the 529 product program description. These documents can be obtained from a financial professional or directly from the plan's website. Please read them carefully before investing. Depending on your state of residence, there may be an in-state plan that offers tax and other benefits which may include financial aid, scholarship funds, and protection from creditors. Before investing in any state's 529 plan, investors should consult a tax professional. If withdrawals from 529 plans are used for purposes other than qualified education, the withdrawal could be subject to a 10% federal tax penalty, state penalties, federal income tax, and state income tax. Brad Baldridge's Disclosures Brad Baldridge is a registered representative with Cambridge Investment Research. Securities are offered through Cambridge Investment Research, Incorporated a broker-dealer, and member of FINRA and SIPC. Brad Baldridge is also an investment advisor representative with Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, a registered investment advisor. Baldridge Wealth Management and Baldridge College Solutions are affiliated. Cambridge and the Baldridge companies are not affiliated. The registered branch location is at 10521 West Layton Avenue, Suite 200, Greenfield, Wisconsin, 53228.